There we go. Isaiah 44 means we are two-thirds of the way through the book. The 66 chapters, we're in chapter 44, and that seems like we've been a long way. Uh, a review of the section here, in these chapters in the 40s, 40s, 41, 42, 43, 44, it's really one giant prophecy, especially in these uh, few chapters in 43, 44, and 45. Uh, it's hard to break it up. Isaiah is speaking in the same context and about the same things, generally speaking. And we've seen in summary, in Isaiah 43, 1 through 7, these statements where Isaiah says, Behold, and uh, the, the Savior, the Lord, is manifest to Israel. And he says, Behold your Savior. So whereas before it was God saying, Look at my wrath I'm going to pour out on you because of your sins. Now in this section of Isaiah, it's I will deliver you, I will save you. So behold, look, your Savior is coming. I am your Savior. I am your Lord. I am your Redeemer. And so in Isaiah 43, we had the teaching of Behold, I'm the Savior. And then in that same chapter, he goes on to talk about how he heals the blind in Israel and identifies true believing Israel. He washes Israel, makes them clean. And then he declares that I am he. I'm the one that was going to save you, and I am now here to save you. And he says, you are my witnesses. And, and then in Isaiah 43, at the end of the chapter, he says, I declare a new thing. Yeah. Right? So I declare a new thing, and a new way. Uh, but then at the end of 43, uh, bad news is Jacob does not call upon him uh, and does not, uh, he, he, they don't wish him to save them. And so that's a problem. Though he offers to blot their sins out. That's what Isaiah 43, the end of the chapter says. So in Isaiah 44 here, we'll see at the first section, he actually pours out his spirit upon Israel. So he says, even though you have denied me, I will, I am your Lord, I, you are my servant, I will pour my spirit upon you and I will save you. And I drew a chart up here because as I just went through that summary of the last chapter and a half, uh, we see similar events happening in Jesus' ministry. Now, prophetically, historically, this is speaking about their captivity in Babylon and how He's going to send them back. As we've seen through all these prophecies, these are not completely fulfilled by the event of their return from the exile. Uh, in fact, we see more of the fulfillment in Jesus' earthly ministry. And we'll see complete fulfillment in His return and Israel's return in this kingdom. But in Jesus' earthly ministry, as we know in the past in the red letters there, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and early Acts, we see the baby being born, and the angels, and the shepherds. Behold, the Savior is born, and He's manifested in flesh as a man. And then He starts to heal Israel. So we have healings, right? And we have washings with baptisms, right? And He starts to identify who the believing disciples are. Right? He chooses some, and these are those that receive him and those that don't. And then, before he leaves, he declares what we saw last week in uh, John chapter 18, when, he, when the, 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 the guards come to take him uh, to trial and to crucify him, he declares, I am he. Remember that? He said that a few times. And so he says that. He says in that last meal with his disciples, uh, I declare unto you the New Testament. This, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. And so there's a new thing that's going to happen as a result of what he's about to do. And then Jacob rejects him. Israel crucifies him, right? They don't call him for salvation. They call him, uh, you know, a blasphemer. And they kill him. Of course, he raises from the dead. And then he pours out his spirit upon those that believed and heard that he was he, he uh, that I am he, that he is the Messiah. And so these events, you see, are the chronology of Isaiah 43 and 44. It's very interesting. Uh, because we saw in Isaiah 43 very clearly, Jesus was speaking there. He says, I am the King, I'm your Redeemer, I'm the Savior, there's none else. So Jesus is speaking in Isaiah 43, before Israel's exile, about things He would come to do in His earthly ministry as well. Isn't that amazing? And so they could have known, you, the prophet spoke of the things that Jesus came to do. As He said, I came to fulfill the, the prophets, search the Scriptures, they speak of Me. Yeah. Right? And thus, he, when he rose from the dead, he opened their eyes to the Scriptures to show them how the Scriptures spoke of him. Right? And so, thus, we can go back now to the Old Testament and see Jesus there, and see the Messiah there, and see these events in Israel's prophetic program there. Now, all of these things I mentioned are here. You'll also see these things fulfilled, again, this chronology fulfilled here when he returns, where as the clouds roll back, you see, behold, your Savior, right? Behold, this King who's coming. 
right? And he's going to come and heal the nation and identify who truly is going to get in that kingdom. He declares, of course, I am the righteous one. I am the judge at that point, right? And this new thing is going to be fulfilled in this kingdom on the earth. Never before had a king and righteousness reigned on this planet like Christ will. So this new thing. And then there's this Holy Spirit. Israel will reject him, but they get judged. But there'll be those that receive him, and they get the kingdom. And that's where the Holy Spirit gets poured out upon the whole nation. And all of Israel is saved, and all of Israel has the Holy Spirit in them. thus fulfilling this new covenant that God had promised since the world began. So you see Isaiah 43 and 44 speaking of these future events in Israel. The things in the past, in time past, Paul says, are shadows of things to come. But Paul also says, but the body is of Christ. Now, the body is not the thing to come. The body is what was happening now, Paul says. So, what they were speaking about were about things to come. But there's something else, is what Paul says in Colossians 2. But the bodies of Christ. Let's get into the, the, the verses in Isaiah 44. Isaiah 44. Verse 1, he says, yet, which means you got to know what happened in the previous chapter. Even though Jacob uh, was given to the curse in verse 28 of the last chapter, and Israel to reproaches, yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel whom I have chosen. Uh, if you are chosen, you have been elected. Right? In the Old Testament here, there are two entities that are elect. One is the Messiah, as we saw back in Isaiah 43 at the beginning, where he says there's this one man who is the chosen, the anointed, the servant. And then there's also the nation Israel, which is the elect and the chosen. So you have the Messiah and you have the, uh, the people of God, Israel, being the elect. And so here, Jacob, Israel, is the chosen. In verse 2 he says, Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. This is the theme, not only of chapter 44 here, which is predominant, but also in the chapters around this, this chapter. This idea that you shouldn't be afraid because of where you're at. I'm going to save you because I have made you. I've chosen you. What's Jeremiah say in Jeremiah 29? I know the thoughts I have towards you. Uh, and that's not some personal, I'm going to color your, your head. This is, he has a purpose for this nation. And so, though they're in captivity, he's going to bring them back. This is his, according to his purpose. He's ordained this. And so, these statements about you being my servant, I have formed you from the womb, uh, it speaks to him being the Lord and God and Father of Israel, you see. And so, uh, that's what all this, this language speaks about. But this phrase, fear not, shows up many times in this same section. Going back to Isaiah 41 in verse 10. He's constantly saying, fear not. You know who also says, fear not, in the Bible quite a bit? Jesus, and around Jesus' earthly ministry. Remember the angels appear and say, fear not. Jesus comes and says, fear not. <laughs> he resurrected from the dead. Fear not. Yeah. Right? And so, this constant trying to comfort Israel, because things are happening according to God's purpose, as it was revealed in the prophets. I'm not speaking Calvinistically here. I'm speaking as God has spoken about already. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. <clears throat> Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Why aren't you afraid? I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. And so the fear goes away because the strength comes from the Lord. That's the preaching from the verse. And he says, I am with you, which is also a comfort. Down in verse 13, I, the Lord God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Fear not, thou worm, Jacob, ye men of Israel. You can't do it yourself. You're, you're a worm. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. So you see there, he's going to do it for them. He's going to make a new sharp threshing instrument, verse 15. Uh, he's going to uh, help deliver them. Right? So um, he's not going to forsake them. In Isaiah 41, then, we see the promise of God's strength and power given to Israel. Don't be afraid. I'm going to give you the power and the strength. I'm going to help you. Look at Isaiah 43, 1 through 5. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by my name, or by thy name, thou art mine. You are mine. I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Look down at verse 3. I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave uh, Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia for Seba for thee. I've paid for you, right? Since thou was precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. 
So he says here, fear not. Why? For verse 5, I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east from, uh, and, the, and the gather thee from the west. He says, don't be afraid. You're precious to me. I love thee. I've redeemed thee. So there's the fear not because you have my power, you know, that I promised. Fear not because I've loved you enough to redeem you, right? And here in Isaiah 44, verses 2 through 8, it's the same statement, fear not. And here we see God's spirit poured out. Isaiah 44, verse 2, thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb. Verse 3, for I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon my seed my blessing upon thine offspring. Fear not, I'm going to provide the strength. Fear not, I've loved you, and I, you're precious to me. And fear not, because I'll pour my spirit upon you. Right? You're, you can't do it. Your flesh is weak. I'm going to pour my spirit upon you. And so, it's interesting. You see here this fear not, and it's in the context of God saying, I'm going to give you my power, my love, my spirit, which reminds me a lot of what Paul said. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind, right? What's that spirit going to do? Well, he's going to teach some things to them. He's also going to strengthen them. He's, he's going to do a lot of things for them. He's going to bless them, right? Uh, the difference between what Paul says and what Isaiah is prophesying here, even though it's the same God who's saying he's not giving you a spirit of fear and fear not in Isaiah 43 and 44, is that what God has told Paul to comfort us is different. If you read 2 Timothy 2, verse 8, 9, and 10, Paul talks about this calling, holy calling on the body of Christ that was given to him and to give to the church. And, and this is why he says that we don't have the spirit of fear, right? But it's the same power of God and the love of God and the, and the, the, the mind of God that he is revealed now through the, to the church and through Paul that takes away the spirit. It doesn't give us a spirit of fear. Israel had a spirit of fear. What was their power? Physical deliverance. They're going to be... Their, their bonds won't only spiritually be broken, but physically broken, right? Uh, the love that he has, as we've seen throughout Israel's history, not only to judge them out of love, but to bring them back out of love. That's why he doesn't destroy them entirely, right? So we see it in prophetic context. In the spirit here, we'll see the blessings, some of those blessings that come on them as he uh, pours out his spirit on them. So I thought that was an interesting connection. You can make that cross-reference. Another example of how Paul uses language of the scripture, but he does it according to the mystery, Okay, and so it's not that Paul can't speak at all anything that the rest of the Bible says. It's the same God from Genesis to Revelation, you understand. And God does pretty much things according to the same way in his character. He's always a loving God. He's always a holy God. He's always a gracious God. It's always his dealings with humanity and ours with him. It's the special terms that he's offering. It's what's happening in the immediate context that's changing. But it's the same God, right? And so if God's offering salvation to these people... It's going to be with the similar language as he offers salvation to us. Different terms, right? Di different uh, fulfillments. Meanwhile, let's move on here. In verse 2, it says, Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. I've got to give you a little tidbit here on Jeshurun. Uh, this is the only time in the Bible this, this name for Israel shows up. And it is a name for Israel. It's a name referring to uh, blessed Israel, uh, the, the chosen of God. It's, it's kind of a Apparently, the commentators say it's, it's a play, playful name or a play on the name of Israel. It's like you're a child to me. You're my servant. You know, it's a friendly name. But meanwhile, the only other place that it, sh it shows up in the Bible is in Deuteronomy. For 32.15, 33.5, and 33.26. So Deuteronomy calls Israel Jeshurun in these three places. Isaiah calls them that here. You say, so what? Well, that shows you that Isaiah, or who wrote Isaiah, knew Deuteronomy. Right? God, God inspired it through Isaiah, of course. The skeptics of Isaiah say that this part of the book was not written by Isaiah. They, the same skeptics might say, as the German higher critics have said, that Deuteronomy was not written with Moses. Moses didn't exist. There was no Sinai experience. The law was given in the days of Josiah, which are after Isaiah. But this is an evidence here that Isaiah knew Deuteronomy. Because the name was only other mentioned in another place in Deuteronomy when he, was, he formed Israel. So Deuteronomy was written before Isaiah when the Bible says it was written. So Amen. if you care about that, you know, tuck that away. If you don't care and you believe the Bible, then good. Believe the Bible. You have no question about it. You'll be better off. Uh, meanwhile, let's move on to verse 3. I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. This, as we've seen throughout these prophecies, this salvation context, 
can only ultimately be fulfilled over here in this kingdom. Revelation 21 22 talks about the water of life freely given through the throne of God as it's on the earth, and talks about those who can freely drink of it. And there'll be no thirsty, there'll be no hungry, no death there. You see, so this is the ultimate fulfillment of this. Uh, but he says, I will pour out water upon the, the thirsty and upon the dry ground. This is a prophecy that has been repeated through Isaiah. Look at Isaiah chapter 35, just to remind us of a few of these places. Isaiah 35, verse 6. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart. We saw that happen in Acts chapter 3. And the tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. Popular bookmark verse. People take it spiritually metaphorically. It's talking about a desert and waters. Why do you take it literally? Because it happened literally in the Bible before. They were in the desert, and they struck the rock. They shouldn't have struck the rock, but out of the rock came the water. Right? And in verse 7, And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water, and the habitations of dragons where each lay. And so there will be grass there. All throughout Israel's prophecy, it speaks in terms of the land bearing fruit and being lush and green when Israel is blessed, when God blesses the world through Israel. There's a connection between Israel and the earth, as we've seen, and Israel in prophecy. You don't understand Israel unless you understand prophecy. And you can't understand prophecy unless you understand who Israel is, because they're connected. Not so with the new creature of the body of Christ. Since you can't find the new creature described in prophecy, there's not that connection. So you can't understand prophecy without Israel and vice versa. They're connected there, and the earth as well. Okay. Uh, similarly, just as heaven is in many ways a mystery to people even still, the new creature, which has positions in heaven, was the context or the content of that mystery. And so you see that, that connection there. Isaiah 41, verse 18, he says it again about this water in the wilderness. I will open rivers and high places, fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. This is his promise that the Holy One's going to do. Right? Where Moses uh, struck the rock, uh, Christ will not fail in doing what God needs done. He is God in the flesh. And, and uh, he started that with his first coming and his death on the cross. When he comes back and leads them through that wilderness, he will be their Moses. Right? He's the one greater than Moses, greater than Solomon. Uh, we won't be following him there, which is why our instructions isn't to follow the Lord. Israel's always was, follow through the wilderness, follow on the way, right? Our instructions is to believe on the Lord, to, to believe, because he's not here, we don't even see him, and yet we believe him in his words. Until that day it becomes sight. So, Isaiah 43, verse 19, Behold, I will do a new thing. What's part of this new thing? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And so the spiritualization of that verse is the new thing, is Jesus' new covenant, and they think, well, that gets rid of the Old Testament in Israel. Now, what do you do with all this talk about rivers and land and earth? And every time the, the spiritualists want to make the, the new things of the Old Testament uh, exclude Israel, they also have to exclude the earth because they're connected. Yeah. Right? And so, well, it, that new thing is the new covenant. It's the church now. It's not Israel is what they say. And it's also not literally healing the earth either. It's also not literally saving people from death either because that's what Israel's salvation would do. Right, the, the physical healing of the earth and the people who lived here. Moving on, look at John chapter 7, verse 38. In John 7, And though there will be literal water being provided for this remnant of believing Israel in the wilderness, for Israel returning from their exile, John 7, there is a connection metaphorically in the Scripture between water and the Spirit, because the water gets poured out, literally, as the Spirit gets poured out. Literally. And so there's this connection here. In John 7, 38, 37, 38. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. That's a strange statement. Like, what, is he buying drinks for everybody? What's happening here? He said, come to me and drink. I am the, the water. I am the source of this. Now, he's saying that because of verses we're reading like in Isaiah. When the Lord comes and when that new thing happens, he will provide water. So he says, well, come to me. Follow me. I'll lead you to the water. What's Psalm 23 say? He leads me beside still waters. Right? Well, who's the leading? Jesus is leading. Right? 
John 7, 38 then says, He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And it says, But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given. So, he's speaking of a thing that hasn't happened yet, but he's talking here about water being poured out and talking about the Holy Spirit being poured out. Okay. So, the Holy Spirit has a part to do with this new thing, this water, which is exactly what we see in Isaiah 44, where it says, I will pour water out on the dry ground, on those that thirst, right? And then what's it say right after that? I will pour my Spirit out. I will pour water upon him that is a thirsty, the floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon th thy seed. They're in the same verse here, just like in John 7, 37, 38. Right? The, the land, the healing of the Israel is connected to the healing of the land and the solving of the world's hunger problems. Right? They're all connected there. So this is why dispensationalists recognizing that Israel and the church are different and recognizing that connection with Israel in this healing program know that the world's problems will only eventually get solved when Israel in this new thing occurs, getting rid of all that. So in Isaiah 44, uh, verse 3, then we have the Spirit being poured out. Now, obviously, the Spirit being poured out should bring our minds to think about what's happening right here. The Spirit being poured out here at Acts 2 at Pentecost. Uh, Acts 2 is not the only time in the Bible the Spirit gets poured out. And people will read Isaiah 44 and say, That's a, that is prophesying about Pentecost. We've already spoke about how that, that appears to be a connection there. But now I'm going to explain to you how these prophecies in Isaiah 44 were not fulfilled at Pentecost completely, ultimately. Because this is the ultimate fulfillment of these prophecies in the kingdom, Right? Israel didn't get saved here, like all of Israel, right? The prophecies were not finished here. So though there's a, a, a foreshadowing, though, and it's definitely speaking through this event here. Acts 44, I will pour my spirit upon you. Upon who? A few or the whole nation? Because in Acts 2, they were hiding out. And the spirit was poured out on some. There were some others that believed, but the nation ultimately rejected them. Okay. And so it did not lead to this kingdom. So that was put on hold there. But the Bible speaks about pouring out the Spirit in many other places. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 23. I've already spoken to you before about how Saul and other people in the Old Testament, the, king of Israel, the first king of Israel, uh, the Spirit came upon him as he was anointed, and he started speaking in prophecies. David uh, was filled with the Spirit at a time, and then he pleaded not to take that Spirit away from him. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 23, Solomon writes... Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit upon you, or spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. You see here a connection by the spirit poured out unto them and the words made known unto them. People want to hear God's voice, want to know how he's speaking. Well, he speaks through the spirit inspired scripture. So David spake as the Holy Ghost gave him utterance, right? The, the Holy Spirit wrote this book, right? God wrote this book. How does God speak to you? Well, listen to the Spirit's words. I'm trying. Well, you've got to look down at the book and open it up. That's how you hear the Spirit's words. Okay, it's not some unction inside of you. And so Proverbs 123 speaks about it. Isaiah 32 sp speaks about the, sport, uh, the Spirit being poured out in the same context as the water is being poured out on the ground. He's going to pour water on the ground, a Spirit on the people. Right? That's part of it. Matthew 3.11, John the Baptist preaches about he that will come after him, baptizing you with the Holy Ghost. That, of course, is Jesus. He'll be doing this. Right? So, fulfilling Isaiah 44, that the Lord's going to pour out the Spirit there. But it's not fulfillment of Pentecost for these various reasons. Look at Ezekiel 36, and I'll show you here. Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36 speaks about this new thing, this new covenant. This new operation of God for Israel and their salvation. So you go 36, verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. When is the then? Verse 24 says, I will take you from among the heathen, gather you out of all countries, will bring you into your own land. When Israel is brought into their land from all the nations. You see how that can be foreshadowed by them coming out of Babylon into Israel? Right? Yeah, so they're in heathen lands, they're coming back. That's definitely a... A partial fulfillment of that prophecy, right? 
But here he says they're gonna get, he's going to gather them out of all countries, bring them into their own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. You shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. We'll see tonight in Isaiah 44 this, this huge section about idolatry. He's going to clean them from idolatry. As they come back from the heathen territories, there's a cleaning process that happens. Right? In the, from their unbelief and from their paganism, they get back to being God's pure, clean, sanctified people. So that should teach you why John the Baptist comes water baptizing. And why it was so ignorant for the priests to come to John the Baptist saying, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Right? Like, what do you mean, why am I doing this? Israel's filthy. <laughs> That's why I'm doing this. That's what John the Baptist says. Right? Uh, he's preaching water baptism for the remission of sins. And he's doing it in the wilderness because that's what the prophecy said needed to happen. Amen. It was, a, it was a, a, a word against the city itself. That it was too unclean. I had to come out of the city to do this water baptizing. Even though they were water baptizing in the temple. They were doing that every day. Right? So Ezekiel 36, he says, I will clean you. Verse 26, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. This is Isaiah 44, 3. I will take away the stony heart of your flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh. So it's not hard, but it's soft. It believes, it hears. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Now, people love to spiritualize this and say, well, this is the body of Christ. This is the church because we have a Holy Spirit. No, you're not. The spirit dwells in you. Yes, the spirit dwells in us. But does he cause you to walk in God's statutes? First of all, we're not under God's statutes and commandments. We're not under the law. But secondly, he's not causing you. He definitely instructs us to do good works. But then we're making this choice, aren't we? There, there, there's not a, a causation there, but he's causing them to walk in the statutes. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Like you shall. Well, if it's a shall, like you're going to, that's not today for sure. And you know what? It wasn't fulfilled at Pentecost when Israel rejected and stoned them. And they had to leave the city, right? So you have in verse 28, And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. Ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. Even as people spiritualize the spirit part and say, Well, we got the spirit too. Yes, but you're not under the law, and you don't have a land. Part of the same context here is you'll be back in the land that I promised you. Israel is connected to the land. There are new covenants connected to the land. So what land is the church's exactly, Right? Uh, there's no word promised to us, which is why building buildings for churches is not a God thing. That's the same type of category as changing the toilet paper and the light bulbs. It's like, that's the category. It's not God doing it, it's just you doing it in order to do the function of what God has told the church to do, right, in ministry. So Ezekiel 36 is not fulfilled yet. Look at Ezekiel 37, verse 6, next chapter. Ezekiel 37 is where God raises bones out of the dirt. Right? Puts on the sinews and the muscles. He raises from the dirt the nation of Israel. 37 verse 6. I will lay sinews upon you. I will bring up uh, flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you. And ye shall live and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Raising Israel from the dead has not happened yet. It hasn't happened yet. Right? But this is the new thing. I'll do a new thing among you. I will bring you back. Right? From the dead. Ezekiel 37, verse 14. And shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. It's in the same sentence. Put my spirit in you, and ye shall be in the land. So if they're not in the land, while they have the spirit, it's not being fulfilled. They had the spirit. They were trying to get into that temple. They kept getting kicked out. Eventually, they were scattered out of the city. And Hebrews had to be written to say, it's all right, guys. God is going to fulfill that which he promised. It's just not this city you're looking at right now because that thing's corrupt. Meaning, this isn't fulfilled yet. Right? Ezekiel 37, verse 14. So when you go to Acts 2, go to Acts 2, verse 19, and you see what's happening here, which is a fulfillment of prophecy, not just not the fulfillment of prophecy. You hear what I'm saying? It's not the complete fulfillment. Acts chapter 2, Peter says famously, after they start speaking in tongues, and people say they're drunk. Remember what he says? It's only the third hour. <laughs> yeah, there's that. In Acts 2, verse uh, 19, uh, let's look back up to verse 15. These are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is about the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So Peter is saying, this is a fulfillment of prophecy. It's true, right? God said he would pour out his spirit. There's many prophecies that say this. Proverbs 1 says this. Isaiah 32 says this. Isaiah 59 says this. With the coming kingdom, 
God has brought His Spirit. The kingdom can't be here unless His Spirit is in His people Israel in their land. Right? So the Spirit and kingdom, they're connected. We'll see the Spirit come up again in Isaiah many times. It's always connected with their salvation and the kingdom. And so Peter's preaching, here's the Spirit. So now we need salvation in the land, and we've got the kingdom. So they're preaching this gospel, this good news of the kingdom at hand, if they will receive it. He died, sent the Spirit, they receive it, they can get saved, and we can all dwell on the land, and we can fulfill it. And so he says, this is what Joel's speaking about. Joel spoke about how God would judge the world and pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. Let's read Acts chapter 2, in verse 17. This is Joel. Peter's quoting Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, which Peter thinks he's living in, which he is, according to God's prophetic purpose. He's right here toward the kingdom. I will pour out my spirit upon what? All flesh. All flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. This is all Joel. And Peter says, this is what you're seeing here. God's spirit being poured out, and they're speaking in tongues and prophesying. Right? The difference, however, is this was just a beginning, because it wasn't on all flesh yet. Look what else Peter quotes. Verse 19, this is still Joel. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Did that happen? Nope. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Did that happen? Nope. The sun shall be turned into darkness. Did that happen? Nope. The moon into blood before that great and noble day of the Lord come. Has that happened? Nope. So Peter says this is that which Joel spoke about. He starts in with the spirit part and moves on towards this kingdom part eventually through the tribulation of the kingdom. But that wasn't fulfilled, was it? So though he starts saying the prophet spoke of this day, the day the prophet spoke about never completed. Right? It got interrupted. So you got to recognize, so when I say Isaiah 44, though it's, you can see Acts, all, Acts 2 all over that thing, Isaiah 44 wasn't fulfilled there. It, it started there and never finished, right? It never finished. So that's why I'm trying to, to give you that discernment. You can go back to Joel 2 and you can read, look at Joel chapter 2, Ezekiel, Daniel, Joel, in your Old Testament, where Peter quotes this. Daniel, Hosea, Joel, excuse me. Joel chapter 2, verse 25. I will restore to you the years and the that the locust have, hath eaten, and the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. Never, ever be ashamed. Right? And it will come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Excuse me? Peter quotes verse 28. What happened to verse 24, 25, 26, 27, where he says, afterward I will pour my spirit. Where does everyone know that the Lord dwells in the midst of Israel? Where does everyone know that Israel will never be ashamed again? They're never ashamed because what they kept speaking about, that God is the greatest God and He's going to give us the land and the kingdom, has happened. When Israel reaches this point, then the world will know that that God that comes to judge the world and has won that battle dwells in the midst of Israel. And then afterward, what happens? I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Right? That's what Joel 2.28 says. You see there? So, if you were studying Acts 2 and going, why does he quote the part that says after the tribulation and the, what's that? Because he's talking about this. Joel's talking about this. Peter knew that he was heading towards that. He never got there. That's the point. But he's pointing out that the spirit that, that they spoke in tongues by was the same spirit that Joel's speaking about that was promised to be given by Jesus in his earthly ministry, by Joel, by Isaiah. But it never got to the point to complete those prophecies. Right? Thus prophecies yet unfulfilled. Okay, Are we there? You, you see what I'm talking about there? I want to spend some time on that just because there's a, a, an obvious connection to the New Testament here. And we need to see how these prophecies fit in. What has happened, what hasn't happened, how it speaks about how and when they'll happen and the order that they happen. Prophecy teaches us a lot. It's not random events here. Things happen in an order. And we've got to know what those are. We can't pluck a prophecy out of context and say, that's it. Okay. In this dispensation, which I have not drawn on the board... We're not looking for a land. 
We're not looking to build a nation. Look at Isaiah 44. The spiritualization of these verses is horrible. Isaiah 44, verse 4. Will pour up my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing upon thy offspring, and they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. So there's the prosperity, the flourishing. One shall say, I am the Lord's, and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob. And another shall subscribe with his hand to the Lord. He'll write his, on his hand the Lord's name, which is something they used to do. To, you know, what God do you serve? They put it on their, their hand or their forehead, which is why Revelation talks about the mark of the beast on their hand or their forehead, because that's who they worship. And that's why in Revelation, God's true believers had his mark on their hand and their forehead. Whole other topic, but that's what's going on here. They'll subscribe, subscribe, write, right, with his hand uh, 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 unto the Lord. And surname himself by the name of Israel. Uh, call me Justin Israel, you know, that's what I'm going to do. Why are they doing that? Why are people doing this? Now, it's in this verse here where people see evidently, I mean, this includes Gentiles of some sort. I mean, there are people who are trying to take upon them Israel's name. Right? And they go, this is Gentiles. This is, the, this is like today. Gentiles are receiving salvation. Yes, Gentiles are receiving salvation, but I am not taking Israel's name. Right? Name of Jesus? Sure. Body of Christ. Israel? No. Jacob? Nope. Never called Jacob in Paul's epistles. Right? Paul even says there's neither Jew nor Gentile. So he's saying you're not called that. Right? So that's not this. But why would nations, Gentiles, seek Israel's name? Because they're great. At this time, Israel will be great. And the nations will say, take me to your leader. We want to be like you, right? That's never happened before, except perhaps in the days of Solomon, in, you know, momentarily. Remember all the nations coming to Solomon, and they wanted to be like Solomon, which is why you find, and people always question this, black Israelites and others, they think, you know, well, you know, Israel, true Israel is in Africa. And true Israel, you find some remnants in, in Europe, and you find some in the Americas. You find, like, Hebrew writing in the America lands and, and some of the caves and that sort of thing. So where is Israel at? Well, there was a time where the world came to Israel because of their wealth and their wisdom, which Solomon had. And so Israel was exporting their culture. And so you find Hebrew remnants across the world. And, they're go and this is confusing to archaeologists. Why are they? <laughs> I mean, it, apparently what has been invented as Israel, they say, is just... Some ancient civilization. It was the greatness of that small nation. When Israel gets saved, according to the prophecies, that will happen. And they'll all want to have the name of Israel and Jacob, because they'll want to be blessed by him. Right? Because you bless Israel, you get blessed. And so that's what happens. That's what's going on there in verse 5. So the spiritualization of that verse is just terrible. And there's no way the church, we are not taking Israel's name, we are a new creature. Okay? So verse 6, moving on. Uh, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. We've covered before how in the previous chapter when it talked about the Lord, Jehovah, that's what the capitals there mean, Jehovah, if he's the King of Israel, and Jesus calls himself the King of Israel, Jesus is Jehovah. He's the Lord God, obviously. I keep saying this, and I hope it's redundant to you, because these types of doctrines that I keep repeating are not trivial fringe doctrines. These are things that come up again and again and again in the Bible. This is how you know they're important, is they keep getting repeated. Right? Repetition is important to show you what God thinks is important. He's the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last, as Jesus says in Revelation 1. I am the first, I am the last. That he says, I'm the first, not the last, when he speaks of that, that, that terminology, that is speaking about his eternality, right? I am before all things, I am after all things. But in the context of Israel not being afraid, it speaks to the fact of, look, if I've said something, I haven't forgotten it. Right? I have a long memory. I am the first, before any of these other gods were created, all these other nations and countries and powers, and I'll be the last when they're all gone. Right? And so this is speaking to his permanence. And so if he says to Jacob, you are my servant, and he says, I am the first and the last, that's a privileged position, right? The nation of Israel has been formed and made and created and is the servant of the one who is the first and the last. Will Israel ever disappear? Answer, no, right? Because God has made a promise. There'll be a nation above the nations. 
And so they see the hope for Israel here. They're in exile. Well, this is it. This is the end of the nation. I mean, we don't even have a nation anymore. We're just slaves in a foreign country. And he's writing this prophecy saying, I am the first and the last. You won't disappear. And that has, that has maintained its veracity even in this dispensation. Not that Israel has a spiritual privilege with God, but the people have persisted in our unbelief. And so as Paul says, though they're enemies of the gospel, they're elect. According, God has a purpose for them. You know, so they're unbelieving. Prophecy is not being fulfilled today, but it will be. Right? And so this is where dispensationalists are not anti-Semitic. We're pro-Israel in their belief, but also in God's fulfillment of what he's promised them. There's no way, if God is the first and the last, that he has changed or forgotten or given away what he said he would give to, this, to Israel. Right? According to their belief, by the way, their belief in the Messiah. So the prophets speak of, of him. So in verse uh, 6, it says, I'm the first and the last, and besides me, there is no God. The Bible teaches there is no God. <laughs> right? It sure does, if you want a proof text. The Bible says there is no God, but one. Right? It says, besides me, there is no God. And who, as I, shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me? Who, among men or God so-called, shall actually declare a thing to be and set it in order and then make it be? He says, and the, uh, since I appointed the ancient people. Who are the ancient people? Israel. Israel, who are now held by the Babylonians, existed before the Babylonians. Think about that, historically. They were before the Babylonians. They were before the Assyrian Empire. They were, they were there in Egypt, right? Abraham was before then, right? And so you have this lineage, the ancient people whom God says... He's working through this, these people, right? And he's formed the nation of Israel out of Egypt. And he will, he will maintain and preserve them through these empires, is what he's saying. So he set an, an order and appointed the ancient people for a certain purpose and an end. So who else will declare it? Who else will say that these people who have no reason to keep existing will continue to exist? And who makes it happen? The things that are coming and shall come and let them show unto them. Go ahead, speak the prophecy. Speak what you think will happen. Right? Because what God is saying here, the odds are against him. If you're thinking of secular odds, you're thinking of odds without God, right? Disregarding God's prophecies, the odds are against Israel and against the God of Israel, so-called. And yet he speaks it. And so he proves the world wrong by his declaring these things. In verse 8, Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Isaiah prophesied this before Israel was taken to exile. So he declared it before the time. He's declared their deliverance from Egypt before the time. Right? He declared their rise in power with Solomon before the time. He has declared these things about the ancient people. So the ancient Lord, the ancient of days as Daniel calls him, appoints the ancient people and they are the proof of God's power in history in, that, in their beginning and in their end. Right? As he said in the last chapter, he'll say again here, ye Israel are my witnesses to show who I am and the greatness of my power. Right? And, and that, is, that is different than the church's function, isn't it? You know, people today try to take upon themselves the purpose of Israel in witnessing God's greatness and his power, and they say, well, the church, we're supposed to manifest the greatness of God's power. Well, good luck. Right? Well, I worship a God who can heal, and that's true. But then it fails. Some God, right? But Israel, through the prophecies about them, their rise and fall, is a witness to the power of God and his able to declare what will happen, his ability to make things happen, right? Even in their fall. What did Paul say in Romans 11? Israel has fallen. And then after he said Israel fell, he quotes three prophecies that said, yep, and that's what the prophet said. So even in their fall, he says this from prophesying. What was the mystery, of course, was salvation apart from their fall. But even when he starts preaching salvation, the salvation is according to God's character and how he would do it before. By grace and according to atonement, and you need reconciliation and forgiveness, and that happened according to the mystery. So we, we learn that. So Isaiah 44, verse 8, says, Fear not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Even it, Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? He asked rhetorically. Yea, there is no God. I know not any. How funny is this? This begins God's section of humor 
uh, and sarcasm <laughs> in the next 10 or 11 verses as he mocks other gods so-called. But he says, I don't know any other gods, right? which is just fascinating. G that God even speaks is a testimony that there is no other God. There's no other God that speaks. We've seen that before. But then he's, he's considering, okay, I've been around from the beginning. I uh, wonder if there's any other gods, and there aren't any. I don't see any. I mean, that's kind of humorous, right? Uh, but he's mocking these other gods, of course. Yeah. Now, he is saying, I am the only God at a time in which there are multitudes of gods. If you wanted to know what the religious landscape looked like before Christianity, I mean, now you look at the globe and it's like half the world is Christianity. Like in religion, or it's just like those crosses and that sort of thing, right? And then, then there's parts of the world that we don't know much about, like India or China and Asian countries. Like those are really crazy religions because there's no Jesus there, right? This is the thought, general thinking in the West. Well, if you remove Christianity at all from history, what the religious landscape on the globe looked like was Hinduism and Buddhism. Now, I know Buddhism was after Christ, and this sort of, but it's like the, those religions of the animism, Japanese religion, Shintoism, worshiping objects and spirits and things, right? Certain men that they claimed to be divine or had words from God, right? This is what it looked like. And there were many gods. Hinduism today has millions of gods. And Hinduism traces their religion, they say, back before Jesus. And it was. That's what I'm telling you. The religious landscape looked like that. Which god do you want to serve? Any of them. Any of them is fine. In fact, all of them. Serve a handful. Right? That's how it is in Hinduism. What you can't do in Hinduism, the only crime, religiously speaking, the ultimate crime, is to say there's only one. And all those others are wrong. Can't do that one. Because there's many. Right? So that's how it was. They were in a place, in a land, an empire, a world where many gods, pick any one you want. You have your God, I have my God, but there's gods. And to say there's no other God but me is very arrogant. And the only one who can be boastful of himself without being arrogant, which is a false boast, is God. Amen. He boasts in himself because he is that. He's just stating a fact. <laughs> not arrogant because it's not an, an exaggeration. There's no other gods. Right? Besides him. Isaiah 44 in verse 9, he begins this mockery. The vanity of making other gods. They make a graven image. Uh, they that make a graven image, rather, are all of them vanity. So it's not just the graven images that are vain, which we've seen before, but they that are making them are vain, which is what he's going to explain here. And their delectable things, the things they delight in, shall not profit. The things that they delight in the things that they worship, the things that they think are what life is about and what they serve, is not profitable, thus vain. That's the definition of vanity. They are their own witnesses. We said before in talking about idols in Isaiah <clears throat> that the saying has been well said that people become that which they worship. And that's what happens when people worship mindless, thoughtless gods that don't see and don't know what's going to happen. They become people who live in the present, worshiping without thought, without foresight. They're blind. They see not beyond what's in front of them. They don't see the spiritual because the things that they worship is not spiritual, it's material. So they, they are materialistic, right? The things that they worship are proud and arrogant, so they become that. You become that which you worship, which is why when you worship the true God, the God of the Bible, Jesus Christ, and you do that, you become like him, right? Loving and gracious, and how he manifests in this dispensation of grace. You ought to be gracious as Christ was gracious, right? You become that which you worship. And so here he's saying that they are their own witnesses. He says the makers of them are vain because what they're making is vain. So they witness against themselves, right? They see not nor know that they may be ashamed because the things that they're worshiping, the idols, they see not either, right? They're blind. Who hath formed a god or molten a graven image that is profitable for nothing? Who, who's done this? Well, everybody who forms a god is doing it in vain, right? Now, these vain makers are their own witnesses, is what he says, and not a witness of any real god of, at all. Israel is a witness of the true god. These vain makers of their own gods are not witnesses of any god. They're witnesses of themselves that their gods aren't real, okay? And all these makers shall be ashamed of their work, as it says in the next verse here. Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed and all the, and the workmen, they are of men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up, yet they shall fear, and they shall be ashamed together. Let them stand up before me, 
Let them stand up and fight. They'll still have fear. And what is God saying to Israel? Fear not, fear not, fear not. Why? I am with you. It's my power that will save you, right? He says, I, I love you and I have redeemed you. So who does the things to take away Israel's fear? Their God. He's saying their witness is against themselves because their gods don't take away their own fear. Right? They don't worship them. Right? And they can't do anything for them. These idols they make can't do anything in return. They worship things that can't do. Right? And so how vain is that? But, and so this is why he says they're ashamed. And they shall be ashamed together. Verse 12, the smith, this is the, the metal worker, right? The smith with the tongs both worketh in the coals, and fashioneth it with hammers, the metal idol, and worketh it with the strength of his arms. Now notice what he's saying here. This picture, this image of the guy using his arms, this metal worker, to, to pull the tongs of the metal out and form and beat this, this idol down with his own strength. If he's making a god with his own strength, how can the god give more strength than that which he's given it? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense, right? You say, well, these, these, these old pagans, they didn't know what they were doing. People do the same thing today. Yeah. And, and, and don't deceive yourself. There are actually people making idols today, like actual idols, right? In other, in, like I said, Hinduism, but in these countries, that without Christianity, this is still the thing, right? There are still idols on cars. You, you see cars over there in Asia, and there's a statue on every taxi and every, or most of them, if they're any religious spiritualist at all. And you're going, what is that thing? There's a cow there. There's a, some fat guy laughing there. What is that? And they're idols. Restaurants, you walk in as if it's nothing, and there in the corner is some, an idol with oranges in front of it, because the idol's got to eat. But they never do, because the fruit goes bad, and they take it and replace it with other fruit. It's just absurd, but it's part of their culture, right? So you have to realize that how the world looked before Christianity, even though we, we now, within the, the corruption of Christian religion, you know, we're, we're combating false Christian ideas, or doc, you know, doctrines in, in so-called Christianity. But the world also was very pagan and idolistic. And it's worse, however, within Christianity when there's idols. Yeah. Or within these, that's why in Christian worlds, they don't make idols of like a statue now, golden statues, and hand them out to people. They surely don't do that anymore. Oh, wait, they do. In Hollywood? Yeah, they do. You say, well, people don't worship that statue. They spend their whole life getting one. Okay, what about a silver thing with a lopsided ball on the top? Yeah, that, that too. Well, it's just a statue. Tom Brady throws it off a boat. You know, what's, what's the big deal? They spend a lot of effort on this stuff. Who do you worship? What do you worship? What do you do with your life? And who, what do you think is the most valuable thing? What are you trying to attain? Right? What is that goal? What are you expending your effort on? And what do you think that thing is going to give you? That's a worthwhile question. Yeah. Right? And this is what the Bible answers with. The thing that you should be expending your effort and time on is God. Because he has given you and will provide all that you need. Right? And this dispensation is no less true. Spiritually, he's given you all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, and those are the things we need to see the fruit of the Spirit. Right? God can work. Meanwhile, you see the, the shamefulness of idolatry here. People create idols in their mind when they believe that God is not who he is. This is what happens in Western false religion. In the name of Jesus or God of the Bible, they create a God that is not the God of the Bible, and they worship that. Right? Which is what the devil's trying to do, actually. The devil's the God of this world, and he presents himself, and people worship what they think is the God of the Bible, and as it is the God of the Bible, it's the devil, the God of this world. But they don't know they were doing that. I read the other day that there was, uh, there was a, a lawsuit that uh, it was down in Texas or somewhere where the Church of Satan, the synagogue of Satan, was suing the state for prohibiting them from performing their rituals of abortion. Because abortion is a ritual in the synagogue of Satan. Because one of the, the statements in, in the Satanic Creed, and you know, if you, I'm not encouraging you to read their creeds necessarily study them, but the, their creed is simply you do what you want. And another creed is it's your body, your choice. That's, that, that principle didn't get invented by feminism. Right? That principle was anti-Christ. Yeah. Your body, your choice. What's Paul say? Your body was bought with a price. Right? You reckon your flesh dead. Satan says, it's your body. Paul combats that idea in 1 Corinthians 6 when he says, it's not yours. You think it's, your body was made for flesh. No, it's not yours anymore. It's God's. It's not your body, your choice. 
your body, your choice means it's my body, I can kill the baby. Right? Anyway, there's idols created, there's, there's Western religious idols that people worship that are not God. There are, Christian, there are churches that call themselves Christians that serve a God that is not described in the Bible. Right? Well, what is that? Right? So you don't always have to form, in the iconoclastic West, and even then we still have our icons, Catholics and others, right? But we've removed some of the most apparent idolatries and replaced it with invisible idolatries. That's what's happened. More spiritual idolatries. But they're no less false. They're not real, you see. But here he's talking about those who are forming their own gods with their own hands. Today people form gods with their minds. So they think in their minds how God should be, or they'll say, I don't think God is like that. What you think doesn't matter how God is. Amen. Well, a God I worship wouldn't do that. Well, it doesn't matter what you think a God you worship would do. It's what God actually is and what he actually has done like in re reality. So we use the tools of our mind these days. That's more sophisticated type of idolatry, right? The smith with his tongues both worketh in the coals and fashioned with hammers and works with the strength of his arms. Yea, he is hungry. Who's hungry? The smith, because he's been working so hard and he needs some food. He's hungry. And his strength faileth. Like he's tired and hungry. He drinks no water. He's faint because he's forming this God. And if this God is really a God, the implication is, why wouldn't he provide him water and food and strength? Hmm? Because when Israel's in the wilderness, God gave them daily bread and water from the rock and gave them strength and their clothes didn't wear out. Remember Israel? Yeah, we do remember that. So you see, the God of Israel is much more powerful than these gods they're making out of the fire, no matter how big they are and how much they say about what they've done. They haven't done anything. Verse 13, the carpenter stretches out his rule. He marks it out with a line. So here it is. I'm going to make a God. You know, he's drawing the line on the wood. Then I've got to cut it out. So you have to draw your own line for your own God first. Like God doesn't tell you who he is. You draw it out. Remember what I said a second ago. He will create a God in their own minds. That's what the carpenter's doing here. Before the smith or the carpenter makes a God, they've got to have the idea of what it is. Right? He draws a rule. He marks it out with a line. He, he fitted it with the planes, and he marks it out with the compass. So this carpenter's at work here, making it after the figure of a man. <laughs> Why does your God look like a man? That's interesting. According to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house, which is amazing. Even if man can create an exact replica, the, the, the AI and robots is a big thing now, right? Yeah. And there is now a religion created by advanced uh, 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 computer scientists that says that we will eventually create an AI, a god, will create our own god. And they're using that language very blatantly. They, they're not religious in the sense of old religions. Christianity is they're not that kind of religious. But they think this, this being will be more powerful than us, and so they're creating our own god. That's exactly what the Bible says you're doing. And they're doing it out of metal and plastic and materials from the earth, right? But even if you could replicate the exact beauty of a man, like humans, it would not equate to the beauty of God in the Bible. So you look at man's creation and say, I can't, can't distinguish that drone, that android, from another. I can't tell the difference. It's passing, what's the test? The uh, the, the, the test for intelligence that they test for robots. The Turing test. It passed the Turing test. You know, I can't tell I, if I'm speaking to a person or a robot. Perfect. You've recreated what God did. Only God has always promised a glorification of humanity. And what we now see is sin, curse, corrupt, mortal humanity. So try to create that. They can't. They don't know what it is yet. But God has some things to come. And here's the carpenter. He's making his idol out of the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. And so he takes the, the idol and puts it in his house. He hew, and to do that, he hews him down cedars and takes the cypress and the oak. Now, who made the cedars and the cypress and the oaks? God made the trees, right? And uh, which he strengthened for himself. So he, he, he may have planted these trees. He strengthens for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants an ash and rain doth nourish it. Where's the rain come from? Now, I'm not pretending here God's your weatherman, but God created the systems, right? Heaven and the earth and the rain and all that stuff. So, and the rain doth nourish it, then shall it be for a man to burn. So, 
He, he has the cedars that he plants by his own strength. He, he makes sure it's going to grow, and then he grows, and rain comes upon it, and then he cuts it down. Shall it be for a man to burn? For he will take thereof and warm himself. So because he has to warm himself to survive, he cuts down this tree and burns it. Yea, he kindleth it and bakes bread with it. So he burns up the wood. He makes bread with the wood. This wood is so worthless to him that he'd rather cook bread with it and eat the bread and throw the wood out. Right? That's what's going on here. Yet he makes a god and worshipeth it out of the same thing. So here's wood. I'm going to burn this wood up out of existence so that I can be warm. So what's more important, your warmth or the wood? Your warmth. Your hunger and the bread that you're going to eat or the wood? The bread you're going to eat. Obviously, everyone agrees with that. You burn the wood to make the bread. So you eat the bread throughout the wood. You destroy it. But then what do you do? You take that wood and you make a god out of it. Well, if you're more important than the wood, and the wood's making this, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You're more important than the god that you just made, right? And he worships it. He makes it a graven image and falls down there too. How do you serve something that you would just willingly destroy for your own existence? It's just absurd. Right? He burns part of thereof in the fire, with part thereof he eats flesh and roasteth it, and roasteth roast, and he is satisfied. So the man is satisfied. Well, at least you're satisfied. Yea, he warms himself and says, Aha, I am warm, I have seen the fire. And the residue thereof of the fire, that is, the ashes and the wood, he makes a god. So I'll take half of it, I'll burn it up, the other half, I'll make something I worship. Wow. And he falls down unto it and worshipeth it, and prays unto it, and says, Deliver me! <laughs> well, who's the judge over the destiny of this wood? The carpenter! <laughs> I'm going to burn that part of it, and I'm going to use that part for a god. Then he says, Deliver me, O wood! Right? For thou art my god. They have not known nor understood, for he has shut their eyes that they cannot see, and their hearts that they cannot understand. Who shut their eyes that they cannot see? This is the question. Isaiah 6 talks about God sending Isaiah out to blind their eyes and, the, and stop their ears, right? So they wouldn't hear. He's talking about these idol worshipers here and how they make the idols. And they're doing this so ignorantly. There's no intelligence, there's no understanding here of God. And it says he has shut their eyes and their hearts and they cannot understand. The teaching here is that when you leave knowledge and worship of the true God, you will become blind, right? And that's what happens. When you serve another god, you lose understanding. You don't gain it. People have that concept today where they think, well, Christians are so narrow-minded because they serve one god. I serve two and three. I have greater understanding. When you leave worship of the true god, you lose understanding. Yeah. You don't gain it. Right? In the same way that you might have a vitamin or a food that gives you nourishment. You say, well, I don't limit myself just to that. I add other things like, you know, poison and dirt. Well, that's not going to help you. That's going to hurt your health by adding things to it, right? By escaping the realm of what you actually need, right? I'm not just going to ingest food. I'm going to ingest metals and I'm going to ingest, you know, the, the rock over here. And I'm going to start chewing on the pew and, the, you know, it's not going to help you. There's one God this is the God that's talking about in the scripture here, and you worship him, and you get understanding, is what the Bible says. Verse 19, none considers in his heart, neither is there knowledge nor understanding, to say, I have burnt part of it in the fire, yea, also I have baked bread upon the coals thereof, I have roasted flesh and eaten it, and shall I make the residue thereof an abomination? Shall I fall down to the stock of a tree? They have no understanding that they burn part of it, and then to think, shall I bow down to this thing? They just, that's what they do. He feeds on ashes. A deceived heart hath turned him aside that he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? They can't tell the truth because to tell the truth is to condemn themselves. Right? And that's exactly, that's exactly the state of humanity. We so self-justify our ignorant actions and beliefs because to expose them in reality would to show our own foolishness. And so we want to be wise, not foolish, and so we justify ourselves. Right? If we would just recognize, as Jesus taught throughout the scripture, right, but also in the dispensation that, you know, to recognize that you are the sinner, you're the liar, you're lying to yourself. Trust God in his truth and what he said, 
and you will, you will find the thing you, you wanted, which is wisdom. It's just not your own. It's his. You'll find righteousness, but it's not your own. It's his. Right? That's always been the, the idea of it. Anyway, Isaiah 44, verse 21. You had there in the last 11 verses the greatest screed against idolatry in the Bible. It's just, a, God's making a mockery of it. Okay, it's just absurd. In verse 20, 21 then, Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee, and thou art my servant. So instead of Israel forming God, what does God say? I have formed you. He said it three times in the chapter. I have formed you. What other God can say that? Is there any other God? There is no other God. But what do these guys do with their gods? They make their own gods. He says, I made you and I formed you. Right? He says, remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee and thou art my servant, O Israel, that thou shalt not be forgotten of me. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. So Israel is far away, of course, and because of their sins, we saw it in the last chapter, because of the, they were cursed because of their transgressions. And so he says, now return unto me. Why is he saying return unto me? Because I have redeemed you. So you see, prophetically here, this is speaking about a time in which redemption is accomplished for Israel. He spoke about this on Sunday. Christ dedicated the new covenant with his blood. But it hasn't yet been implemented to the point of fulfillment. When Jesus says, look up when you see these signs, for your redemption draws nigh. He was talking about this, not that. This is the blood needed for redemption, but that's when redemption comes for Israel. Look up, your redemption is nigh. And they come and they get redeemed from those nations and get delivered into that kingdom. Okay? But he says, I have redeemed thee. So where's the context here? Right here. I have redeemed you. I have redemption. Christ is saying as he returns, I have redemption for you. Right? Return unto me. Right? Follow me. Notice, uh, just as a matter of language here, he says, I have blotted out as a thick cloud, which you might say, well, how, what in the world does that mean? A thick, how do you blot out like a cloud? Right? Well, imagine you have, I remember when, it, when we were uh, younger, I had less toys perhaps than my son, I don't know. We used to go outside and throw dirt clods at the wall. <laughs> you ever done this? And you throw dirt clouds at the wall, and then what's it do? It's a cloud, right? He's blotting out the transgression. It's like a, he's scattering it, dissolving it like a cloud, right? The cloud's not solid. It doesn't hold anywhere. You can't grab it. It disappears, right? So I blotted out your transgressions as a cloud, your sins as a cloud, right? Return to me. I've dealt with your sins. They're not, they're not a, a, a rock anymore holding you down. They're not a burden to you, right? For I have redeemed thee. So, he's blotted them out, which of course should in your mind uh, remind you of Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Remember Acts 3, 19? Peter preaches, repent, for your sins may be blotted out in the time of refreshing, <laughs> time of restitution of all things, at the appearance and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've already talked about the time of refreshing in Isaiah and the time of restitution in Isaiah, and now he's talking about blotting out their sins at this time that he returns, which is what Peter preaches. Peter, yes, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's not ignorant. Peter wasn't either. He was preaching Isaiah, preaching prophecy. And it was a future blotting out, a future salvation, a future time of refreshing. But that's what the context here is. That's why he says in verse 21, remember these, Jacob. Remember these, Israel. Remember what I've said to you. I am the only God. I am him. What does 1 John write about? Here's 1 John written to people during this tribulation time before this kingdom saying, you need to identify the true Christ. Because there were antichrists. Identify the true Christ. Remember that he came in the flesh. Right? He came in the flesh here. That's the true Christ. When you see that guy come over here, not some other guy that says he's Christ. And it gives tests in 1 John how you can test the spirits to know who the true spirit is and the false spirit is and the true Christ is and the false Christ is. Right? The true believers and the false believers. 1 John's all about testing true and false identity of these people. Right? These, these beings. And Isaiah 44, 21 says, remember this, who the true God is. There's no God but me, right? And remember who you are. You're my servant, O Israel. In verse 22, he says, return unto me. So he says, remember. And then he says, return. And then in verse 23, what comes after the return? Rejoicing. He says, sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, ye mountains, and O forest, and every tree therein. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob, and hath glorified himself in Israel. When is that talking about? Here. First, Israel will remember 
And Zechariah talks about they're remembering, because when they'll see the, the, the scars on his hands, they'll start weeping. They'll remember, then they'll return, then they'll rejoice. That's the order, right? Also, it says here, the rejoicing is in heaven and earth. See that? Sing ye heavens. They say, does it matter about Israel's return for you and I? It does. We're not Israel. We don't have a place on the earth. But this is the climax of God's manifold purpose for heaven and earth. So we'll be in heaven rejoicing because sin is kicked out of the earth too. Right? So, O oh, heavens rejoice. Lower parts of the earth rejoice. Break forth into singing, ye mountains. And people will say, you can't take the Bible literally. Mountains don't sing. Right? You know about figures of speech, right? Taking the figure of speech literally means that this is a time of rejoicing. It's not a time of depression. But I can spiritualize and say, well, singing means the depth of your soul will echo like a cave, you know. A very weary and depressing time. That's not what it says, literally. The letters say singing and talks about shouting and talks about glorification. So figures of speech are part of language. But you take it literally because it's talking about singing and rejoicing and a, time, a good time there. You can't make it to say anything you want. You're confined by the words, right? Anyway, that was an English tidbit for you. But you see the order in verse 23 there. So in verse 24, uh, we see, you've, you've heard the song, uh, Joy to the World, right? Joy to the world, our Lord has come. Now, they, they'll sing that around Christmas time because of this. But then they'll sing, let heaven and nature sing. Let heaven and nature sing. Right? Let heaven, heaven, and... That's when this happens over here. They're singing about this coming being this coming. The writer of Joy to the World was not a dispensationalist. He didn't quite get the idea of the two comings completely. He didn't quite get that. And so he thought these prophecies, he spiritualized, the heaven and nature singing about Jesus coming in the flesh. Okay, well, this is when that it gets fulfilled. Over here, first Israel's salvation in the future. So, the order of the world needs to be changed again. You know, Isaac Watts changed the, 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 so, the song, the tune, that, that was to the words that he wrote, which became popular. So he changed it away from other words. But you changing it again is not going to harm anything. It's been changed a few times. Verse 24, let's see if we can wrap this up here real quick. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things. From the womb there simply means from the beginning, right? I conceived you. I formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreads abroad the earth by myself. This is talking about the Lord. Who, who is this Lord and this Lord that is faithful to do, unlike these gods who can't do anything, the people have to make them and form them with their own strength. He says, I will provide my strength. I'll be, have the redemption, and I'll give you my spirit. Right? And then he says, uh, I am the Lord, that re the Redeemer, that formed thee. I am the Lord that maketh all things. He's the creator of heaven and earth. That stretches forth the heavens alone and spreads abroad the earth by myself. There's no one to help me. I did it. Okay. That frustrates the tokens of the liars and maketh diviners mad, that turneth wise men backward and maketh their knowledge foolish. Praise God that we worship that Lord, you know what I'm saying? Because you get mocked at by people who say they're wise and they're not, and he's the Lord that will make them look foolish. You don't have to. Your God will. Right? Amazing. He says, I am the Lord that confirmeth the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers. So he sends messengers to communicate his message. They don't make it up. They say, thus saith the Lord, he told me. And then the message that he delivers and speaks through his messengers, he confirms it and then performs it. So again, this isn't something where random events happen. Then you look in hindsight and say, you know what? My God did that. I'm going to make a God and call him Thor. Right? He did that. No, this is a God that sends messengers to say, this is what I will do. And then he sends other messengers that says, he told me that's what he's going to do. And then he does what he said he's going to do. And so you see how God is before the things that he said he would do. <laughs> Unlike other nations who form gods based on what they think happened in the past, like Christians do as well. They look back and say, well, I, something good happened to me. That must have been God. The same idolatrous thinking. Yeah. Right? Did God say he was doing that? Because that's how the God of the Bible works. 
He says, I'm going to do something, and then he does it. So that you know that it's him. Right? Else, you may be making a God up in your mind. Right? Be careful of that. So he confirms the word. He performs the word that he spoke. And this is what he says, the word specifically, is that he says to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be inhabited. To the cities of Judah, ye shall be built. And I will raise up the decayed places thereof. And he's saying this while Israel and Jerusalem is built. Jerusalem is built at this time. They're going to be destroyed, which he prophesied already. But then he's saying now, they're going to be built up again. So he's saying before they're destroyed, they're going to be rebuilt. This is prophecy upon prophecy. And it's going to show the glory of God. Amen. Right? He says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up the rivers. See, he says of Cyrus, he says the things, he confirms the things that he says, and he does them. Jesus comes, and he says, if you had faith as a mustard seed, you can say to that mountain, be removed. Remember that? He said you can say, and that's the word of faith doctrine gets invented. Just say whatever you want. No, you can't say whatever you want. You say the things God says, and they do. So the mountain gets removed when God says, go say to that mountain, remove it. And then you go and say, remove it, and then the mountain gets removed by God's power. But if he doesn't tell you to remove that mountain, you're not going to move the mountain, no matter how much you talk. You see, so you've got to know what God is saying. Now we're getting back to studying the Bible really divided, aren't we? What has God said to you? But he's saying here to these people, rebuild the cities, right? These cities will be rebuilt. So don't be afraid. This is, this is going to happen. I'm going to do it. He saith to the deep, be dry, I will dry up the rivers. And he says to Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple, the foundation shall be laid. Right? The temple will be rebuilt, the city will be rebuilt, the people will return. That's going to happen. Right? Else God's not true. The calling of God is without repentance, Paul says. Right? And so we see here this prophecy. We'll cover Cyrus next week. That's too big of a topic to start now. But uh, it's an amazing subject of prophecy. So we'll deal with that next week. Any comments or questions about Isaiah 44?